Hello, everybody. This is Liam Billingham, co-host of Oeuvre Busters. Before we jump into this week's episode on the talented Mr. Ripley featuring Philip Seymour Hoffman. Listen, guys, I gotta confess something. We are not doing great with the reviews. The ratings, the reviews, where are they? Where are you guys? Uh, we would love to get some ratings, reviews. Go on iTunes, give us a five-star review or a four-star review. Be honest, give us four stars. We're not perfect. We're definitely above three stars, but we need to get more reviews. Please, we will read them on the air, so say something funny. Um, also, we'd love to hear from you. Send us a voicemail telling us your thoughts on something we said, telling your thoughts about our opinions on films, telling us your opinions about films. There should be some give and take here. It shouldn't just be us mouthing off. Speaking of mouthing off, eagle-eyed uh, listeners <laughs> will notice there's a Hamilton reference buried somewhere in this episode that I made and totally went over George and Kel's head because they are Philistines that don't know their super popular Broadway theater. Yes, Kel is back with us. Kel is back for this episode, and so is, and I'm very excited to announce... Danish filmmaker Lars von Trier. Say what? Enjoy the episode. I'm going to go away now. Bye. I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Fogopoulos. And I'm Kel Karpinski. <gasps> and this is... <laughs> All right, I'll do it. Uber Busters. Yay! Yay! Kel, Sorry. Kel, 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 Kel. So now the oh, music. Guys, it's so nice here. So, Kel is back. Kel's back. And we're sitting here in the French... No, Italian. Does <laughs> Riviera? Italy have a Riviera? <laughs> they all have Rivieras. I, in yeah, our hearts. I'm making that up, yeah. Um, Kel's uh, back. Kel's back. back. So, Kel was not only our first uh, co-host, co-host, but also our first second timer. Yeah. So, welcome back, Kel. Thank you. How So, be honest with us. How is being on the podcast completely... The changed like, your life. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I can't, like, like walk the down street? the street yeah. without people noticing me and throwing <laughs> rotten fruit at me. Yeah. And... <laughs> people oh, so, so, so yeah, like, people hey, are angry. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I mean, I, I hated on a beloved childhood classic last time, so... That's right. I forgot yeah. Big Trouble. Big Trouble. Yeah. You brought the heat the on I, I brought br- Big Trouble. Yeah. So... The yeah. heat on Big Trouble. Big, yeah, uh, it was and you also had pride. some negative things to say about husbands, which I totally understand. Oh, uh, they were all wrong. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. That was I I'm not going to pretend. Have negative things. I'm to not going to pretend that that was acceptable. Um, and but what are we talking about today, Liam? Uh, well, George. Introduce... Well, George. Uh, we're going to talk about 1999's <laughs> The Talented Mr. Ripley. <laughs> Good year for movies. Featuring like... in a smaller part than I thought he would have, but still a which is Kel pointed that out important too, right? part of the sh- of the film. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, directed by Anthony Minghella. directed and written, also written and directed directed The English Patient, which Bill Billingham, my father, <laughs> was quoted as reviewing the film by saying he should have died in the plane <laughs> crash. <laughs> but then the, wouldn't that have ruined the movie? The day after we alert. saw that he saw The English Patient, I swear to God, I was he, upstairs playing computer games. And he came up, and he was like Liam. Long. Don't ever watch that movie. <laughs> and the next day we went and saw LA Confidential <laughs> and we walked out and he was like, now that that's a movie. <laughs> that there is a movie. Yeah. That other thing last night, that was garbage. Gar- garbage. And my dad was not like, he had good taste, but he hated the English patient. <laughs> Which I is, mean, I haven't seen it. So I haven't I seen you it. never seen it? No. Yeah. Have you seen and it? And you still haven't seen it. I have seen it. I've seen I, it I'm gonna two or three it. times actually. I'm going to watch it. And it's beautifully shot. It's beautifully composed. It's beautifully... Crafted. Kel is already checking her phone. <laughs> she's, she's like, like, cool, she's like cool, uh, cool. guys, uh, yeah, can you just leave? Woof. Yeah, if we're gonna talk about the English patient, um, yes, no, but Talented Mr. Ripley. Talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah. Um, just and based on a Patricia Highsmith novel from 1955. And Kel's a fan. It is, and fact. an expert. And um, already been adapted into a film. Uh, yeah, at uh, least once. It's a purple Noon? Purple, purple Noon. Noon. Yeah. Right? Although it is misspelled like everywhere people write Purple Moon. And so for a while I thought it was called Purple Moon. But it's Purple <laughs> Isn't Noon. Isn't there a movie called Purple Moon from the 70s? Maybe Paper Moon? Paper, uh, Moon? Uh, Paper Moon. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. Um, do you want to summarize the film very quickly? Sure. George? Yeah. I will, okay. And I will. then we'll just, we'll just get into the things yeah. that we want to talk about. Tom Ripley is a man about town. Right. New York City. New York City. Uh, and we quickly find out that he's uh, pretty much kind of, well, I mean, maybe like con artist might be too strong of a word, but somebody who's definitely 
um, conning to kind of like make it a, make it in, make, it make, a, make a living. Meet. Yeah, make ends meet. So he plays a rooftop concert. He runs, um, passes himself off as being somebody from Princeton because he's wearing a Princeton jacket, which is right. I know that's where uh, I'm. That's I mean, I still have my Princeton jacket, of course. Sure, you stole it. Yeah, I stole it. Um, and basically runs into this guy, Herbert Greenleaf, and he and Herbert. Uh, tells him about his son, Dickie, and Tom lies to him right off the bat and says like, oh yeah, like I know Dickie from college. Yeah, we went to Princeton together. Princeton together. And he tells him that his son is basically kind of fucking around, bumming around Europe, Italy. Italy. To be specific. So he hires Tom to go to Italy to bring Dickie back and uh, hijinks ensue. <laughs> that that's it. The end. And, and they live, and they live happily, happily ever, it's, ever a, it's a buddy after. comedy, it's right? Buddy comedy, uh, yeah. No, but uh, so Tom, Tom Tom goes to Italy and become good buds. They become good good buds. Uh, Tom mur- accidentally and almost in self defense, pretty much murders Dicky and then uh, takes over his identity. And uh, that leads to more murders, that including the murder of of Freddie. Freddie played by Philip Seymour, Seymour Hoffman. Hoffman, and then the murder of Peter played by Jack Davenport. Yes. who's so good. He is so good. Yeah. So good. Um, what did you guys think of the movie? Who you had you'd seen it before? Yeah, I've seen it multiple times. Yeah, I, I saw it I saw it in the theaters actually. It's the first time I've ever seen it. And first impression? I fucking loved it. Yeah, I thought it was. I I, I, I George and I have debated this term many times, but like, with, of that kind of genre of movie, I think it's like kind of a master work of that kind of style of movie yeah. in a lot of ways. It's so well done. I hadn't seen it in a long time and I kind of wondered if I had like built it up in my mind. Um, I feel like there's, I don't know, with the the lack of like queer movies that there's like a lot of things that I saw like a really long time ago yeah. and I was like, was it fabulous because that's all that there was or like, is it actually a good movie? Um, and I think it's it holds up. It's, it's really a great, yeah. It's an excellent movie. Before actually we do a deep dive into it, do you want to talk about it um, or compare it to the novel? Because you're the only one that's read the novel. Yeah, I mean, I I honestly couldn't remember a lot about it, so I was I was actually doing some research of what other folks had to say about it. sure um, the differences. But so you know, you I think when we were talking about it before watching it and sort of thinking that the novel was maybe a little bit more like o- overt in the the queerness, but it's actually sort of the opposite. Um, that it's like a little bit less, which the, the book came out in 1955 and I was also comparing, so Patricia Highsmith's, uh, The Price of Salt, which is like a very openly queer, like, you know, it was the movie Carol is Mm -hmm. The Price of Salt. Um, it's like more open about like queer desire comes out in 52, which is, you know, three years earlier, but also she wrote it under a pseudonym. So like uh, that also, I was like trying, I was like doing comparisons and I was like, wait, I forgot she wrote it under a pseudonym. So that also to me says something yeah. that like maybe folks weren't ready for it. Mm. Um, and actually the, the book of hers that is like most fresh in my mind is Strangers on a Train, um, which I read uh, like yeah, yeah. last summer. Um, and is I think it's a movie that Hitchcock did. Did he do a movie? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I no, I couldn't <laughs> really couldn't remember. I honestly, that wasn't a, I couldn't remember if that was a Hitchcock movie, if I was making that up. Did I jump on your, isn't that what the, oh, isn't no. that what the TV show? Perfect strangers is based on also. Sometimes the world looks closer. Sometimes Do-do. you just get a feeling like you need some kind of, did we already do this? Where does, we did, I think. We but, did this last time. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's what also comes out in girls. Oh God. Apartment. Um, Guys, this is the best. I love the way the film was, to, in many respects, kind of true to like its its queerness. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very que- it's a queer film than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. I was really like, holy shit! Yeah. Just thinking about like the actors in it and the time and all these things, like it's so much queerer than I think it would right. be if it were made now. Yeah, but I also love the fact that it was kind in in its historical kind of context. It was it felt to me like accurate to what it must like. Let's say. Have been like if somebody like Tom fall, fell in love with somebody like Peter mm-hmm. and obviously would not be able to kind of like completely and utterly like openly express desire yeah. for this other man. Like that right. one scene where they're being or Tom's being interviewed by the Italian police officer and Peter's translating and he says oh, something yeah. like, oh, yeah, there's no homosexuals in Italy or something. Right. Because the cop basically asked him, like, did you what were, was your relationship with Dickie? He, no, he asked him if he if, if he was if he was homosexual. He actually yeah, he that. says yeah, that outright. But, but wasn't it the implication that him and Dickie might have been lovers? Yeah, but he just he, yeah. But he asked him. Asked yeah, him like, he, yeah, he yeah. does. And Peter yeah. translates for him. But I felt like that was like so honest to yeah. the film yeah. and what the film was attempting to do 
that and I just I just thought it was like great. Well, he has a line that's like a sh- it's which is, makes it hard to explain Michelangelo and Leonardo. Yeah, Leonardo. And Leonardo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're kind of like, wow. I don't know. It just felt it was much more. It was not. I just was surprised at at how clear it was, and that didn't yeah. feel buried in the in the movie at all. Like yeah. I feel like it could have been. If yeah. you read the Wikipedia, <laughs> at one point it's like <laughs> Peter and and Tom become very close. <laughs> You're like really very like close. who wrote this? Yeah. You're like yes, they were very very. I would close. describe them as close. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just a couple more things about the book yeah. that I want to say oh, yes, is please. that um. George. <laughs> there's definitely way more in New York than there is in the in the movie oh. that they're in new york and there's also you get like a little bit of background that he's like raised by an aunt who's like always called him a sissy so there's like definitely like queer elements but it like plays out in a different way right. and like ripley has like way more disdain for marge whereas like he's like sort yeah. of like friends allies with her in the in the film i feel in the book he has disdain for marge yeah interesting um and then also the other sort of big thing is in the book he's more like cold-blooded like no like there's not as much like justification for his murder uh, whereas like here it's like tense it's getting caught but he's like still he's still trying to like build these different relationships at the same time whereas in the book he just reaches a point where he's like you're all gone like you've you've mm. all like been so horrible to yeah. me yeah i felt like the it's, film also did a great job of again showing him to be like the victim and yeah. to kind of again like the the murder of dicky is it's horrifying so much, it's, it's horrifying but it is so much um like self defense like dicky attacks him first and mm-hmm. kind of like provokes him and he obviously kind of insults him and insults like his desire for him and and we should say just really stop quickly like around like one thing that when with one thing that i think makes the movie work so well is the cast yeah is insane so it's matt damon as tom ripley um jude law as dickie greenleaf the adonis to <laughs> jude law so my sister-in-law rebecca weiss who's been named on this podcast before i was texting her i was like jude law is so hot in this movie and she was like jude law is so hot in that movie that it like hurts to look at him but i was like that's a good way to put it uh gwyneth paltrow as um marge 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 whose last name is does, i don't know if it really matters but let's be complete isn't marge margie uh, marge sherwood or oh, Kate blanchett as, as meredith, meredith. logue Jack Davenport is Peter Smith Greensley. James Rebhorn, who's like an incredibly underrated actor as uh, Dickie's dad. And my favorite, Philip Baker Hall as the private detective. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who interviews Speaking of Seinfeld. Ripley towards the end. Of- yeah, and he's also the the P.I. librarian. Yeah. And he's in Hard Eight yes. featuring oh, Philip Seymour right. Hoffman. Yeah. He's the oh lead in Hard Eight. Yeah. Um, I think it's in Kate Blanchett's contract at this point that she has to be in all Patricia Highsmith <laughs> adaptations. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. She, it's so crazy to look at them and they're all the so babies. young they're such babies they're such especially babies. her yeah. she like with, I don't oh know she struck me the most and I actually for, she's a chameleon. forgot that she was in this movie and I think that's part of it too that I was like oh my god which makes perfect sense that she'd be in a film about again a man who is very chameleon like is Tom Ripley Dickie Greenleaf mm-hmm. it, like who but is this so guy's so real a bit more about that. do you mean in the sense that um, as a kind of just philosophical kind yeah, of question yeah like, like well because Tom uh, so first of all Matt Damon is amazing in this movie mm-hmm. he's he amazing, he's in amazing in this movie he looks really good in those swim trunks too he looks good in the swim trunks he's real fit he's real yeah. fit he's, real yeah. fit. he's not real Jude Law well no I mean that's not like a fucking crazy um, but like he just he Jude Law by the way was only like 26 27 27 how old is Matt Damon yeah. oh, he's gotta be 30 okay. he's young yeah. but like you sp- like he just has this I was talking to George about how I feel like I thought about the movie Psycho a little bit like the film and filmmaking in this mm. is like so like there's no movie I want to watch more than like shitty rich people living really nice I lives know. in Europe oh god, like the, you're like oh god this is like mm, oh, this the is Europe, just like a rich porn the thing. Europe the Europe pornography Europe, is like Europe oh my porn. god they but, sail everywhere. Oh, they eat fuck. good food. They do oh, it's fuck like, all. Oh, it's so great. Sit and like, I'm writing. Sure you are, Marge. <laughs> sure you are writing a book. What? What is the book? She never no. says what the book. She's about. writing the price of salt. <gasps> Whoa, no, but meta. it's like you spend the whole you. You're watching this movie and you're like, I don't like. Has is Tom Ripley a construct that this guy has invented? Like, yes, his name is Tom mm-hmm. Ripley, but the like Tom oh, Ripley shit, like as Club. like, oh, oh, I'm t- okay. Like, I can help. Like, oh, Marge, I thought we were friends. Or, or is he like the Dickie Greenleaf character that he puts on? Like, who's the real guy? And what's mm-hmm. great about the ending of the movie is he, he doesn't know. Yeah, it's like kind of, um, you know, 
crazy. And I think the fact that you don't know anything about his origin story is so great because you have to just to get to know him through the action. And like this movie is so cinematic. So little is explained, but it's all like mm-hmm. there. Like I'm thinking of the scene when he watches a big moment for me is the scene when he's watching Jude Law play the saxophone and he's just like completely in awe of this guy. Yeah, well, then, that's when he first realizes that he's in love with him. Yeah, yeah, but also just that he like yearns to be in that energy is so like, and it's like really one of the first moments where yeah, you're kind of like, oh, there's more going on here than like admiration of mm-hmm. like a free spirit, and it's like so well done because you can feel it like oozing out of Matt Damon. I just thought it was like he's so goddamn good, and there's no scene in the movie where he's like, it's because my parents didn't love me. <laughs> like, there's that Robin Williams movie, One Hour Photo. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. It's long time ago. it's fine it's good and then in the last 10 minutes robin williams is like my daddy dirt me you have to explain to our younger viewers what a one hour photo is it's a (laughs) store where it takes an hour to get your photos developed it's like your phone but much slower (laughs) i don't understand yeah so i was just very impressed by like the fact that it i I read that the novel explains more of his backstory and i'm just so glad they didn't do any of that in the movie well and you also see like he's like committing all these crimes in New York too and like his big scam is that oh. he's um, sending letters pretending to be the IRS and telling people that they owe like $64 like under under 100 like amounts of money Whoa. and that they need to pay to like this certain P.O. box or whatever and like I'm pretty sure though like in today's dollars 1955 it's like That's a, a million it's, dollars it's a good amount it's 64 dollars is 128,000 dollars because you double million the amount and then you add a yeah, hundred thousand that sounds about right so that's, that's like some bezos money bezos buck. yeah it is interesting to think about him in the movie as like this kind of blank slate yeah mm-hmm. well because i feel like he becomes tom ripley in this movie as opposed to being him before i think that's something that the movie makes a conscious decision uh. to do is he like kind of becomes the monster that's really interesting. As opposed to well, I mean, you, you literally get like get nothing of his origin story, and even like the first things we see. I don't want to know how I got these scars. <laughs> Where you see him on his own, like he's listening to like all the jazz albums, but he's like already yeah. preparing to like, you know, if not like subsume uh, Dickie's identity to like ingratiate himself or like to. Maybe yeah, that's, that's not the word. But he's like already. Me. I don't think it's necessarily sinister, but like we know nothing about his personality and the like even glimpses of his personality are actually to like impress other people. Right. Well, we know he's a, ta- he's a talented music or at least has a, some sort of kind of talent. Yeah, I guess music. that's true. Cause there is that yeah. really, which is again, so subtle and so well done where that scene where he kind of sneaks onto the piano at Carnegie hall, I believe. Mm-hmm. And clearly he shouldn't be playing the piano and like the janitor like flips on the light. So and basically says like, get the fuck out of here. I think that scene is a goodwill hunting reference and I'm not kidding because Friday here night, we go. as you may know, I live tweeted <laughs> goodwill hunting and there's the scene in <laughs> goodwill hunting <laughs> where the two professors walk out and they see him doing equations and they're like, you can't be here. And he just goes, sorry. And he runs away. That's the exact same thing. What that year was it? Was it 97? 96. 96. I mean, obviously, oh. it probably it was there in the screenplay, but I could not stop thinking like, that's a good one. Like, Maybe that is a little like, I mean, it could have been. Goodwill hunting. Goodwill Ripley. Because he's playing the piano Goodwill beautifully. Ripley. And the guy's like, you can't be here. And he's like, sorry, I'm sorry. And then he like runs away. It's the same thing. Would it be Goodwill Ripley? Would it be the time? I'm not going to sit Mr. here. I'm not going to listen. <laughs> hunting? Which one would it? What would it be? I don't know, but it wouldn't be any of those things. Really this things. might be a better movie than Good Will Hunting, though. What? Yeah. I, I mean, this film is so. There's a moment in the film. So one of the other moments that I think really stands out for me, and then I want to hear what you guys think, is the moment when he decides to fake Dickie's suicide, and he's right. You hear it, he's dictating this letter and yeah. he's scratching out his face on the passport face, yeah. and then there's a very specific line that i wrote down where he's looking at the like uh, he's looking at the table and he like the, the, the he closes the the sh- this like sort of panel and his f- you can see his face but like as he moves it sort of starts to like look like it's spreading apart it's really really weird and he had there's a very specific line in the screenplay at that moment and it is you the line rocks? is i've you made a mess i've made oh. a <laughs> you've <laughs> You bred raptors? You bred raptors. Um, the line is, I've made a mess of being Dickie Greenleaf, haven't I? And you're just dun, dun, like... Dun. See, you said earlier, by the way... And but, we could, that's, but that's I Tom maybe Ripley more, more pretending to, to be Dickie Greenleaf. I think he does turn into Dick, Dickie Greenleaf, though. I think yeah. that's the tragedy of it. And I think the, mm. the, the, why I say that also, because I think the point of the movie or where the point of the movie takes you yeah. is that basically like he, he has to kill his lover to some degree because like he has to be straight. And that's why I texted oh. you both and I said, oh, the real villain in the film is like heteronormativity. Mm-hmm. 
And I read it as that as a kind of a uh, like compulsory heterosexuality um, theme, right? That he, yeah. the only way that he can get out of being who he truly oh. is is to be straight. And that's why the it's so fucking heartbreaking when he murders his lover Peter at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's the only one that, that really like hurts. Yeah. Does the ending of the novel uh, match up with the ending of the book? Well, or the film? So, um, Kate Blanchett's character doesn't exist in the oh, book, no and Meredith. she's like added in, um, which I yeah, again, like I completely forgotten she was in it. But then also I forgot that she's in the end, and it's yeah. so weird because she seems like just sort of like a passing character. Yes. Yeah, and then you're like, you're gonna murder your lover for for this person that you yeah. like barely know, right. yeah, yeah. and that's why I feel like I think you're totally spot on, George, because I feel like. Like, otherwise it just like doesn't make any sense because you're like he needs to save his reputation of like pretending to be dicky for her like who cares like that's interesting though because i think at a certain point he says something asks her if she's alone on the trip and she's like no i'm with all these yeah. people and i think it's because he's like if you're alone i'm gonna fucking kill you yeah i think his plan is oh to yeah. Kill yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but question. he can't because he she's can't. with yeah whereas he's alone with peter it also feels a little convenient that she happens to be in all these places. Yes. But I well, also, then the when you, and then, but particular. then when you think about expatriates living in foreign countries, they all go to the same fucking places all the time. They do. So and like, they're all like wealthy and they could like travel in the same circle. Yeah. All yeah, of a sudden, yeah. Totally. Um, both literally and Everybody figuratively. Knows that's the time of year that you want to be in Greece. Well, tell, tell me about <laughs> it. Wait, am, I right? am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Um, but also, yeah, I can't exactly remember how, I mean, the novel ends in the sense that in the same way in that like he's like le- he's fleeing Italy to like travel around yeah. Europe and like continue to like hide out while he's like committing these murders and then the next book picks up is Ripley's Game which is um uh they made in 2002 with John Malkovich as Ripley which is funny have you but seen also it? I have not seen that one the 1977 Der, Der Freund by Vin oh, Benders oh. um and Dennis Hopper is Dennis Ripley. Dennis Hopper is Ripley. Whoa. Um, but Bruno Gantz is in it also, which oh, is awesome. The best. Um, you, you all know I have a soft spot for him. He's in the new Lars von Trier. Bruno Gantz is amazing. He's in the newest one. Lars von Trier? The House of Jack Bill? The House of Jack Bill. Huh? He's yeah. also in the new Malick film. He plays right? uh, the history of serial killers or something. I haven't seen him. I'm not going to see that piece of shit. But take that, Lars. Yeah, I know he's listening. Obviously. I'm very upset. <laughs> why does Liam oh, no. hate me? Oh, no. Why does Liam <laughs> why hate Why does he me? hate me so much? <laughs> He's the only man who can hurt me. <laughs> oh, no. Um, but he does not take a gay lover, if that was the... He doesn't murder his lover. He doesn't murder like, his lover. I, yeah, I can't remember, like, what else happens, but it is him, like, fleeing and sort of trying to, like, uh, you know... So it doesn't have this anguish that the movie has at the end of it. No, and it's I. it was much more devastating this time, I feel like, for some reason. Wow. Watching it. I was like, it, yeah, it tore my heart out and stomped on it yeah, a bit. Because you're really, like, you're like, sad. you're like, oh, you found someone and you can be together and like, you can be yourself finally. And then you're like, fuck. I totally forgot also about the appearance of Meredith at the end. And yeah. but it, I think maybe I did remember maybe a second, a split second before you saw her. I just want to be like, push her over the edge. <laughs> just, just <laughs> get no, rid no of one her. has to know that this yeah. ever happened. Well, kill her, kill the really uncle, kill the aunt. You can just do it. By the end, you're on Matt Damon's kill them side. All. You're like, yeah, yes. get away. Is there a point that you're not on Matt Damon's side? Time. Well, I mean, I don't know about that, but like he's, we were so, I feel like he's the scene where he's about to murder Marge. Marge sure. is about as like you're like mm-hmm. yeah yeah. By the way, Gwyneth Paltrow is great in this she movie. Is. I hate to say it, but she is. Why? Because of because of goop. Yeah, yeah that's I fine. mean, come that's on, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Otherwise, she's fine. Because of Apple, not the kid herself, but the fact that her mom decided to fucking. <laughs> Why call are you her so Apple. upset with? Because of Coldplay. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Coldplay. Lars, what do you think? Yeah, that's very stupid. Oh, it's very stupid. Why would you name your kid oh. Apple? <laughs> So dumb. So dumb. Liam, why, why, why haven't you called? <laughs> but Liam, why would you? <laughs> but I think, no, and because we, we talked about this on, on the uh, on the car ride over to what degree, because I thought. It's great to reference things that aren't on the podcast. I thought that this could be our new tagline. It's great to reference things that weren't on the you podcast. You weren't there for it, guys. And neither was Cal, but. I think, yes. um, what we're going to talk about right now. I Because one thing I said to Liam is like, oh, I wonder if the film isn't fair to women or in like Gwyneth Paltrow in particular, mm. um, 
but you pointed out that it does a good job of showing how the men in her life are really gaslighting her and obviously she's yes. kind of mm-hmm. the Cassandra and kind of basically saying like no I know the truth and like sure you do yeah all right yeah. Marge. because the detective also says something about or maybe even the dad both of them maybe mm. say something about oh you know how emotional women get or how oh yeah can. there's yeah. a couple times where they're like the dad is like oh well let's talk about this when Marge is not yeah. around and like all this stuff and you're like yeah, dude, you're yeah. like dude Marge knows what's going on yeah she totally does She's and it's dumb. also great too because earlier in the film she clearly says something about the fact that she knows that Dickie's also like fucking around with other women. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. she said on the boat when, so Freddie shows God, up. There's so much to this movie. Yeah. So Freddie shows up. P, 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 PCH? P, 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 PSH? PSH. So Phillips are often plays Freddie. 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 And he's kind of um, Dickie's like friend from college or something. He's this kind of like um, he went to party Princeton. animal. He yeah, went to he went to Princeton also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when he shows up, he obviously kind of gets in between Tom and Dickie being best buds. Um, but there's a line when they're hanging out, of course, on their boat, which is called Freddie which is, Miles, which is named Sorry, Bird. That's right. Yeah. Um, after Charlie Parker. After Charlie Parker. Oh, Jude Law loves yeah. jazz. In um, Purple Noon, it's named Marge. Oh. And so I, so I didn't jazz. know why it was huh. called Bird, but I knew that it was not called Marge, and I found that intriguing. Uh, Elaine Delon. I got to see that film. Yeah. I've yeah. never seen it. But there's I that, now want to do all the Ripley stuff, though. There's I'm a great, become a Ripley story. In. Ripley Hud? A rip head, rip head, rip head. But there's <laughs> there's a line where, yeah, that's good. Cool. Really oh, I like it. Yes, it's <laughs> but, very good. But there's this great line where uh, Gwyneth Paltrow says some of the lines of like, oh yes, it's great when Dickie's uh, sun is shining on you, um, and you're kind of in the spotlight. Yes. But then when he turns away, you're like left in the cold. Um, and he does that for both like men and women. So clearly that like Marge knows a lot more than she lets on. And you know, it's interesting because we didn't quite get into the sort of the milieu. Oh, thank you so much. How did you know? Ooh, milieu. The milieu of like sort of the, the small Italian town that all these American Which expatriates is made up. are in. The town is made up. Yeah, yeah it's not a real it place. Yeah, it's not a real place. But like, you know, they're all just kind of hanging out. They all have money. They're doing whatever they want. And like, yeah, I think one of the best choices the movie makes is to make Jude Law's character, Dick, uh, uh, Dickie, not super sympathetic, but also mm-hmm. he, he's so charming that like you go on yeah, the emotional yeah. roller coaster oh, yeah. with um, Tom Ripley that that it's just very affecting because you're mm-hmm. like, oh, what's yeah, I've yeah, like you really the feel hot for him. Veneer, and then when sociopath. he's murdered, it's such an upsetting scene it because is. it's so violent. Oh, and they're like when he also kind of cradles his corpse. Oh in, yeah, in he boat. likes he like spoons his corpse spoons for his a while. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, who doesn't? do that well i mean yeah, of course yeah. but i mean you know to do it on screen is one, one thing. yeah to, yeah for sure but, a lot. but then also like to, when you and when you actually take it into account and you think about oh yeah this man has murdered two men that he loves <laughs> oh know? yeah well and i think that's why the the second one is so much more tragic somehow is oh, like yeah, it's like yeah. You've you've had a chance at this twice, and I mean, yeah, the first time is a little more like self defensey, but mm-hmm. obviously the second is. But also the first, well, he one. also doesn't know when to stop with the first one. Like he could have not killed him. Oh yeah, yeah. I but think. also the first one, there's clearly, I mean, he, that's it's it's a breakup scene too, where he oh, kind of yeah. says to him, "I'm gonna marry Marge," and Tom's like, "What the fuck are you talking about? You cheat on her all the time." Yeah. Clearly, you might have wanted to fuck me in the shower or in the bathtub. Yeah. Um, Could we talk about that bathtub? Yeah, let's talk about that. No, just keep going. Oh, about his ass cheeks. Yeah, his great ass cheeks. No. Go ahead. Oh, no. And it's it's a breakup scene. And um, shit, where was I going with it? I just now I'm just thinking about his well, ass. Well, it is just a it is just a breakup. It's scene. a breakup I think scene. That's the thing that's interesting. Oh no, but going back to this idea that he he was never going to really be with Dickie. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes also the second one so much more tragic because he has met somebody who loves him. And and it's unconditional. Kinda, yeah, and it's unconditional. Yeah. yeah. Um the the one moment in the film where I felt like I don't know, like I was a little like more like repulsed by Tom Ripley. Like maybe the only moment is one of the first times when they're the three of them are all hang when Marge, uh, Dickie, and Tom are all hanging out, and Tom does the impression of his dad. Oh mm. yeah, yeah, I like oh. that. Like also like knowing what's coming, but also just like it's so intense, and he just keeps going and going, and like Dickie is like getting a kick out of it, and I was like, I would be like, I'd be see so ya. skeeved. I'd be so <laughs> fucking ya. skeeved. Like that was the only moment it's that skeevy. I was like, well, I totally. Ooh. Forgot that he also just tells them about the plan right away. Oh yeah, and I didn't know so, if that was because he wanted to just hang out with Dicky or because he felt like this is the best way to actually get him back home. So this is something that I wonder about between like an adaptation of a novel is that like to me movies have to have like a very 
compl- it's hard to have backstory in a movie and have it be really effective. So like mm-hmm. you almost need to, as a writer, I feel like a lot of the time be like, okay, what's the arc of the character? And so the, there's like the obvious arc of the character, which is that this is about a guy that like finds a false relationship and destroys it and then finds a true relationship and destroys it. But also it's about him. Is it, is the secondary thing about this guy becoming this sociopath? Like, is he this guy before the movie starts or is it something that emerges over mm. the course of the movie? Because I think it's a more interesting movie if, if you go into it with the intention of this guy is figuring this out as he goes along. And yeah. that makes him much more chilling of a character to, 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 to contend with. And then also, then there's that actual character of Tom Ripley. There's a guy who's like, oh, huh, I'm going to do an impression of your dad because I want you to accept me. And mm-hmm. like, I'm going to tell yeah, you about the yeah. plan. Like, he fumbles into yeah. his own like... well criminality so to speak well in the way that matt damon plays it like so when tom is wearing the princeton jacket playing the piano and he meets dickie's dad and dickie's like dickie's dad is like oh you went to princeton you must know him he like pauses and clearly like the wheels are spinning and then he's like oh how do i do this and then when he goes back to Rome after he's killed or wherever he is after he's killed Dickie and the um, like the guy at the hotel is like, oh, Dickie. Right, and he pauses. Again, there's like a similar pause and then like the wheels are turning and then he's like, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so I that's feel like that's a weird moment. But I feel like both of those are sort of like getting at what you're talking yeah. about that like you can see it sort of like developing. Like he's not necessarily going in being like, I'm going to con them and this is what I'm going to yeah, do yeah. and like this is how it's going to go down. He's like, he's having these like revelations and sort of like working it out as he's going along. Because in the beginning of the film, so the first thing you see him do is playing the piano at like a little recital kind of deal. And then the next thing he's doing is he's. Um, he's he's like a he's a b- bathroom attendant, yeah. right? And so mm-hmm. it's like he's not even a hustler at the beginning of the movie. Well, he's just well, but kind right of for that scene though. Sorry, he runs to the car and he throws in the Princeton jacket to somebody else. Yeah, and he but says, that like, doesn't. Thanks for that. I mean, yeah, and that's I like a really subtle nod, I think, to the fact that he's doing everything he can to kind of survive. Maybe it's a, yeah, but I also yeah. think that that's different. That's like a twenty-two-year-old guy with like creative aspirations. Totally. It's not like a <laughs> like it's it's, no, it's yeah. totally. And it's also an interesting movie what it says about class because it's. like like he's this kid who probably I don't even know where he, I don't think the movie ever tells you what like his background is at any point you know, yeah. who just kind of cons himself into like a reception where he can meet people of affluence and wealth and that's yep. exactly what happens well and that's I think it's made a little bit clearer in the book again because you get this background story but also even in the film it stood out a lot to me too there's like all this stuff like he's trying to like clean up his stuff in the apartment and Dickie's yeah. like the maid will handle that like yeah. what are you doing like stop t- no, and he even like point, yells yeah. at him at some point yeah and there's this whole thing and then like Dickie gets really angry at him for like mooching off of him or whatever yeah, call him leech. and all this stuff and it's like dude you guys have money coming out of your ass yeah. you're all independent wealthy marge is working on this novel that's like never gonna happen and like you're upset because he's like hanging out and getting dinner like a couple nights a week with yeah. you guys like i don't know well that that seems to also be in, in this where i think um philip seymour Hoffman does such a great job because he's such a fucking obnoxious asshole in this film yeah but that Dick, he's it, so funny though. it does it doesn't get into like really dickie's head about um Tom being a leech, as they call him, until like Freddie shows up and he's like, "Oh, you got this great gig. You're just fucking hanging out, and, like eating Dickie's food and listening to Dickie's records." Right. Um, and clearly, also one one can I think argue that it's coming from a point of jealousy with Freddie, yeah. but it's also at that <laughs> moment too where Dickie starts like thinking like, "Oh yeah, I guess he kind of is like a leech." But yeah, the class dynamic is really really fascinating. Um, and the movie explores all of these, not to, but I think that one way. of the things that I think makes the movie really classical to me is that it it it's not it's very kind of it deals with issues of identity and like existential s- issues and issues of class in very deep ways but it does it through like such a clear slingshot of a narrative that you're not sitting there thinking about like it's only it's the kind of movie that mm-hmm. ends and you're like wait a minute like who is this guy i still don't feel like i know who this guy i feel like i've gone through a journey with him but like it, the movie never pauses to ask you to think about what it's about thematically, which I think is so effective for like a classic Hollywood kind of, you know, it's like Hitchcock. Yeah. So the movie that I think about a lot with this is a movie like Hitchcock or a movie like Psycho because mm-hmm. Psycho has the same, I don't know if it has as much about class, but it certainly has a lot to say about identity. And I think kind we of also like, mentioned like the psychosexual dynamic. Psychosexual yeah. dynamic. And also like films like Shadow of a Doubt, like it's, it, it has a Hitchcockian quality to me mm-hmm. in that you spend so much time engrossed in the narrative that you're not thinking about what else is going on. Like Psycho is a tweaked movie. The more you think about that movie, the more you're like, what the 
Or how the fuck it got made, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and really also just like what... There's a whole podcast series about how it got made, and it's really, really good. But you're just kind of like, who? What? Who is Norman Bates? And I feel like I felt the same thing. Like this, I've thought about this movie for three days because I was just like, I'm so perplexed by it. But while watching it, I was like, this movie is entertaining as fuck. Mm-hmm. But I think again the thesis is that if you if you're gonna be if you're gonna be rich if you're gonna be straight you have to be kind of a homicidal man. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. And that's the critique. I think that's yeah. what makes the film so fascinating too. So even aside from uh, thinking about it in terms of sexuality, if you think about it in terms of class, it's like yeah, if you're if like that's where rich people are. They're just yeah. sociopaths. Well, I mean, you also <laughs> how dare like... you? I make <laughs> X amount of dollars a year. Well, I mean, yes. I, mean, I didn't obviously... come to this apartment to be told that I'm not rich. I mean, the non podcasting rich uh, obviously those who podcast i'm rich with likes get their get their wealth and deservedly grams. so <laughs> we fucking lifted our bootstraps we decided so to Cal, talk at the microphones how are you doing? and we're filthy rich um so Cal is rich kel's literally counting money count but kel is counting one dollar <laughs> bills pennies pennies, pennies. Um, well, also, I think, you know, now I'm making, making all these connections now that we're talking about this stuff, but, um, Good. T- Tom becoming, so Tom becomes Dicky after murdering or Tom, be- yeah, Tom yeah. becomes Dicky. Sorry. After there's there's, there's a lot of identity stuff happening. Um, after, after murdering Dicky, his love, but Dicky also murders his love in a way. Ah. Um, his Italian lover. Oh, she yeah. 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 comes to him she's pregnant and he's like she wants money for an abortion i think and he is like leave like go away oh, and I then didn't she goes the, uh, the abortion thing yeah so uh, through the film we see dicky flirting with this like woman who lives in the village yeah. Silvana, yeah. and obviously they've had an affair Check. and that's a beautiful scene too where they raise there's, there's like a festival of the madonna mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. and they raise this like madonna from the water beautifully shot it's very upsetting. and then the woman yeah Silvana's corpse also kind of like yeah. floats to the surface um and this is also where you kind of i mean obviously dickie's an asshole but he does such a great job of obviously showing that he's anguished that this woman yeah. has died and then he clearly feels totally shitty and guilty because he's responsible for it and he's great because yeah. he doesn't have the or the he's not so does dickie doesn't strike me as strike me as like the smartest guy in the world but he He's really good with people, and he but he doesn't know how to process things like this. So Jude Law is so good in that moment because he makes it about like, where's the ambulance? Where do we live? Yeah. This place yeah. is so oh, yeah. backwards. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, like, you barbaric. fucking... Ugh. Rich asshole. Um, question, are we supposed to assume or think that... So at the very end, one of the reasons Tom gets away with it is because the detective basically says like, oh, yes, Dickie also... Uh, was violent and was kind of mercurial. So clearly it makes sense that he would like off himself. Right. And the detective tells Tom that Dickie beat the shit out of somebody at Princeton. Are we supposed to assume that that was also an act of like homophobia? Oh, so uh, that like he, sh- he like really hmm. strikes against Tom obviously, or like he gets really fucking upset because like Tom is clearly saying like, this is like the end of our relationship and he can't mm-hmm. deal with it and deal with his own kind of, perhaps like repressed desires and he strikes out obviously he attacks tom and we're supposed to maybe think that the violence also that he inflicts on this other kid in princeton and we don't find out really obviously why Mm -hmm. but i was like oh is it because of like dickie's homophobia i mean sure i also feel like it's a it's a yep (laughs) yeah done done done. but i I also think that it's like we it's worth digging into a little bit the like the dynamics between the sort of triangle between um Freddie, yeah, yeah, Dickie, yeah. and Tom, because that's to me that's like the core of the movie. And I think that coming back to that bath scene, mm-hmm. when I was watching the movie, I was like, I fucking can't believe how gay these guys are. Yeah. Like, just and like again, mostly because I just didn't expect it from the movie. Like, yeah. I kind of really thought. I mean, my whole relationship to this movie before was like, look at that. Uh, picture of those attractive people in italy Mm -hmm. and i was like oh it's like a there's like a sort of a thriller element to this thing but there's like chunks of that this particularly the bathroom scene where you're like guys just fuck (laughs) and they're playing chess just the the chess was a little bit too heavy-handed but yeah yeah but 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 like i mean no the whole thing is heavy-handed like matt damon's just like nice cock dude yeah. like it's just right? so obvious like <laughs> playing with the water and like yeah, yeah his whole, hands in the water and jude law notices is, yeah. it and jude law doesn't if well, I mean, jude law, but he makes like a clear overture and jude law's like no obviously like jude law still like teases him by like getting yeah. up like naked 
and like looking back at him yeah and so like the clearly he's also yeah. like obviously uh, like teasing him um and to some degree desirous i think but but also i wanted to be like you can't be that uncomfortable you were bathing yeah. naked right. in front of him yeah. and you already sort of like you must have picked up on like the other things that he's been throwing your totally. way yeah i feel like i don't know the what you're saying too about the the princeton him like kicking the ass of this other dude or whatever it seems like when he's pushed to these extremes yes that yeah. he's like i can't handle my desire so like i lash out right um because I, f- I feel like dickie definitely has desire for tom yeah i agree um yeah i think he's also like it's an interesting dynamic to think about in terms of like jude law's character is like he's terrible but he's also charming and you spend so much of the movie like he just wants to, he's one of those people that just takes things from other i c- can't believe i thought yeah. of this but like i thought about um the guy that uh the g- <laughs> this is ridiculous the guy that leslie nope dates in the second season of parks oh and recreation <laughs> who uh, uh what's his name ron is like he's a tourist like he's the kind of guy that comes into people's lives and like does impresses them the and does his thing and then disappears yeah. a little oh. bit like and it's like he's that kind of guy where you're like you want him he's the life of the party you want to be around him and the second that you're not useful to him anymore it's like bye you gotta wonder what's keeping him with Gwyneth Paltrow's character in the movie like is it a genuine well, like, again love it's or? like kind of the like compulsory heterosexuality in this yeah. kind of yeah. sense of like oh okay yeah this is like sure. what I have to nah, do nah it's not that it's, oh, no no no, nah, no it's no, not that, that. hang on <laughs> Lars <laughs> yes <laughs> what do you think <laughs> I don't know I just make films I just make films I'm just an artist I have a problem I, with women I think he does I think though um really terrible problem I think yeah, keep going. The dyna- no, I mean, because we, you wanted to talk about the um, dynamic between the three of them with Freddie. Yeah, and then when so yeah, Freddie shows, shows up, <laughs> everything like, changes. Totally like cock blocking Tom. Everything changes oh, when sing, you love sing someone. Sing to me. Oh, God. No, that's all I got. <laughs> okay. oh, I don't even know what hey that one was. So, Freddie. <laughs> Um, yeah, I said I thought he was in the movie more. First off, I remembered him being in the movie more. Well, he's makes he's, a big. He's got a presence. he's got a big presence. He's got a big presence. He, he definitely takes up the screen. Um, <laughs> his there. very first line is like, "Don't you want to fuck everything that moves in in, a, <laughs> in Italy Rome, yeah. or oh Rome?" And I was like, "Dude, he's so keep much it in your pants." he's so much um but also yeah i know i said to you you all earlier that um i remembered his character being a little queer yeah, yeah and so i think i mean i still think there's definitely something there and he's clearly like vying for dickie's attention as well and i also i do think though there is something about which is this is what i remembered mostly is the interaction where he confronts um tom later at the hotel or wherever yeah. you know the room where he's staying or whatever that he's staying the room under, where it happens under dickie's name where he ends up killing freddie or whatever know. but something about their conversation makes me feel like um sort of like the way that freddie susses out like what's going on is because it's like a queer in like i know what's going on because uh, i know like what scene you're in and i know like what you're into and like therefore like i can put two yeah. and two together and i feel like there's yeah, like rem- I remembered it like as having like more there being more to it or whatever, but I still think that like there's something there. Yeah, well, the like the really intense and this is what's really interesting too. Like the really intense romantic scenes are always happening between men, so oh, it's either yeah. between let's say Tom and Dicky, or even like t- even like Dicky and Freddie when they're listening to the music and like the, the closed booth and they're like on top of each yeah. other. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, you, there there are moments where Dicky is. Um, like if, like intimate with uh Gwyneth Paltrow and there was that one scene later where they're like in the boat yeah in the boat for example um but other than that I don't like, I'm trying to think if there's another scene where Dicky is like warm in that sort of way to Marge and I don't think it I don't think it is like I don't think really. there, there really is another scene no not really you don't really moment. get a great day you get that one scene that they have like early the most on intensely the where he's like I don't remember him from men. Princeton and then you have like a few other moments yeah there's nothing yeah, I think it, you know, it's interesting to think about Philip Seymour Hoffman in this film because, so we pre- previously we'd watched uh, Big Lebowski where he's just so like, <laughs> and then in, and then in um, happiness. happiness, like yeah, this I listened whole, to happiness today, the nice, episode. Nice. Have you seen happiness? No, and I will not now. Yeah. Oh man, I feel like we've you. discouraged more people it, it, from this thing than we've encouraged. <laughs> Which is fine. It's, it's something. I I, pro- I mean, have the DVD. Do you want to buy the DVD? It's only eighteen dollars. No, I don't. <laughs> sorry, oh. no, I'm sorry. Nineteen. We yes. marked up. I like some of other of Todd Salon's 
movies and like it was like on on my sort of list but it, films with strong sexual violence themes do not oh, or yeah, do not rank it. high on my list so i will not be watching it it's a good pass then but it's an interesting thing to see him and like you mentioned in the last episode the physical kind of yeah the, the way he embodies the roles. Like, way he embodies the roles and i think that like it's interesting to see, you know, like one of the things that made Philip Seymour Hoffman really distinct was like his look and his size. Like mm-hmm. he was like this chubby leading man in Hollywood that got to do a lot of things. And I think that one of the things that's great about this movie is he's just like, yeah, fuck it. Like yeah, I'm this yeah. big. Yeah. Like I'm, well, I'm like, a, yeah, like everyone else in this yeah. movie is sort of like, yeah, is sort of like traditionally beautiful. And then you have this guy kind of walk in and like he uses his size and his space and his like over. He's like clearly mm-hmm. created this sense of like. Mm-hmm like huge confidence and like you can see it in other movies that come later but like this is an interesting sort of and he's a bully of like yeah he's a total, yeah. bully. total bully and there's no remorse in that guy he's just like our question it's great it's a really good performance and he's yeah, like amazing. the only actual threat to tom ripley early Other in the movie tom himself because tom ripley can Ooh, min- whoa, whoa. Oh, <laughs> george i think you're grossly misreading this <laughs> character um, mars shut the fuck shut up the God, we invite you on one episode. I'm sorry. Just suck the fucking air out of the room. Oh God, sorry about that. I didn't shouldn't have brought him. Um, he just flew in from Denmark. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> his arms. But I'm. I'll go wait in the I'll car. Be here, I'll, be, I'll be in the car. You drive on the funny side of the street. You're from Denmark. Try not to make any fucking misogynistic films on the way down to the car, asshole. Oh, I was going to make three. <laughs> uh, um. But he, because Ripley's so good at talking his way out of things, and that guy is just like, I don't fucking talk. Oh, I'm he's just, just like a big, d- I just I'm a do. bruiser. Yeah. I'm a bruiser. And he like humiliates him tight, like the, the well, when Gwyneth Paltrow yeah. and... Uh, well, it's interesting also to think about him in that sense, too, because the, the smart thing to do after you find out that when the landlady sees him, so at that point in the film when he goes from, from the apartment, he's under Dickie's name. And obviously he walks into the apartment and he thinks he's talking to Tom. And then the landlady sees him like looking over the balcony when Freddie's talking to the landlady and she points to, Oh yeah, look, that's Mr. That's Mr. Greenleaf. Like the smart thing to do at that point would to leave and go to the cops right away. But he right. doesn't, right? He goes up to the room to confront them and that's when Tom like murders him. But I guess it does fit into the, the character because you'd be like, I'm not going to, I'm yeah, not, not going to fucking yeah. go to the cops. I'm just going to go fucking like confront this guy or possibly beat the shit out of him. Right. Um, Talking about how beautiful and cinematic this film is, though, oh, when he, k- he kills Freddy and the um like the statue that he like bashes oh, his head in, bus. like roll like yeah. yeah like rolls away with like the blood on it. I'm like, it's fucking beautiful. Yeah. Is that, is, is, that yeah. is anybody know who that bust is? Um, I believe it was um Sophocles. No idea. Oh, nice. Yeah. I I think it was. Oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Do you think it was me? Do you guys know any Shut Italians? up, Lars. <laughs> oh, so many. Who are you going to um, You were like Chef Her- Boyardee. Her- Her- Heraclitus. 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 Oh, Parmenides. 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 Mario. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mario. Ba, ba, ba. Hey. <laughs> Mar- Mario. Uh, it's of like Mario the Luigi. statue falls and rolls. It's just an 8-bit graphic with blood <laughs> on the side of it. And you hear like some like... like burm, burm, burm. I, guess it was the, I guess that's the... Uh, that's the music from uh, not Wheel of Fortune. Kamala. No, bam, bam, bam. We turn the wheel. Price is right. Yes, and you bam, bam. Anyway, I'm leaving. <laughs> Are you still here, Lars? <laughs> yes. I'm gonna cut. I'm in Kelly's kitchen. Um, to, I, a lot it? of this out. Can we talk about the soundtrack? Yes. Let's um, do it. I did not really pay attention to this. Oh wait. Well, sorry. Go ahead. Well, a few things. So apparently, the the song that. Um, the Italian song that Jude Law and Matt Damon sing together oh. are actually is like actually on the soundtrack, and then um, Matt Damon singing "My, My funny, funny Valentine" is on the oh, soundtrack, beautiful. and it's like kind of incredible. Is yeah. that him singing though? Yeah, yeah. No, it is him singing. Yeah, because I was the, wondering if it wasn't him. I watched it on Amazon and the pop they give you the little trivia on the yeah. side if you want it, which is so great. The X-ray, and that one of the things that come up is like Matt Damon actually recorded yeah. this, wow, and it's beautiful. That, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was amazing. But also, I don't know. There's um, uh, Miles Davis's Nature Boy playing Nature yeah. Boy yeah. through, and I don't know. I just felt like that was the one that like stood out to me the most, and I feel like there was like something like very like haunting about that yeah. song. But also, like I don't know. To me, it's a very like queer song as well. Really, um, that song. Yeah. I don't know. It's all like 
I don't know. There's something. I got to listen to it again. Maybe I didn't process any but of like it. Like the sense of like being like a natural man, that kind of sense. Or it's called no, nature boy. Like the actual like lyrics to oh. the, like the, the, um, uh, I think I'm thinking of the wrong song because I'm I'm not remembering lyrics at all. So maybe it's a I different... don't know. There's something because he's like mysterious and mm. like uh, no one knows anything about him and like there's like there's something there's like an ethereal quality right. like a sort of like otherworldliness to me that like I don't know is something is I don't know. I I'm gonna felt go, like it I'm gonna really well. listen to this song on yeah. the, later on. I thought I also you were gonna mention the opera scene, which is great too, where they're watching the opera Eugene scene is incredible. Yeah. yeah. And it's so I love shot. that they stayed. Or they found an opera, and we're like, let's just. I don't know how they did it. Like, I'm always curious like, about how those things are yeah, shot. Did yeah, did they like spend like the money to produce this opera? Was this something that was going on? Did, yeah. you know, I'm, I always want to know right, that kind yeah. of stuff Cause it's because it's a beautiful it's, production. And it's an exp- I mean, this it's was a not a cheap production. movie. This was a forty million dollar film, yeah. which is crazy to think that this movie was yeah. made and it was a 40 million it's huge it's like a huge movie and they would never spend that kind of money on this now. Yeah, there's nothing per- there's nothing per- fucking, <laughs> fucking suits tell me about I it would, I would never get that kind of budget <laughs> for my women hating <laughs> films but there's also something to be said I think about um, like you said it's definitely like it has like prestige film Oh, it was a Miramax it. production, and Miramax in 1999 was like unstoppable. Yeah, like it'd be interesting. Like I'm sure this was nominated for a whole bunch of stuff. So I don't think it actually was nominated for that much stuff. But we should, I um, should double check that while we're sitting here because I don't actually remember. Do, 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 bow, bow, bow. But sorry, Kel. Oh well, uh, while he's talking, can Kel. I add a, another a, a Patricia Highsmith Please. a couple of trivia Please. moments? Um, first off, she said that uh, Dennis Hopper made a horrible Ripley. Um, Yikes. I was the best fucking Ripley man. That's which is pretty good, thank dude. You, thank you. I was working on it. It's which, very good. I, which I kind of feel that way. I don't know. I just couldn't. I I was like picturing like Easy Rider, I Dennis know, Hopper like, the whole no, time, like, yeah. and I was just like, I don't King know. Cooper. Like Dennis I can't Hopper. imagine like your like young Ripley is Matt Damon, right. and then he's Dennis Hopper. What did you say it was made in the eighties? Um, seventy seven. Okay. All right. But so still, he's still fairly youngish, but still, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other Patricia Highsmith thing is that, um, she was like obsessed with the character of Tom Ripley so much so that she would sometimes sign her letters, love from Tom. Whoa. Wow. Well, she went back to him so often in writing so many of these novels. Yeah. It'd be interesting also to think about, so... You said the f- wait the first Ripley novel was written under not no the the Carol novel Price of Salt was written under a pseudonym yeah huh I just interesting to think about let's say a deflection of her own like queer desire mm-hmm. in the sense like oh I can write about these gay men because I'm not a gay man but yeah. like when it comes like to writing about these gay women I have to kind of like deflect it or it's too close to my own yeah. experiences so I have to write under this like pseudonym well and I don't think she wrote any of her novels that have gay male characters under pseudonyms like strangers on a train was her like all this stuff which i also want to say like strangers on a train the novel strangers on the train the film are like not that interesting but the queer movie classics book about strangers on the train Mm. is like the most fucking interesting thing i've ever read um it's this like series called like queer film classics or something like that and they just like do different films huh. and so like that was one, strangers wow. on the train is one and then um like pink flamingos and like <gasps> there's a few other ones mm. um and the strangers on the train like i i read the book i watched the movie and then i watched or i read this the queer movie classics book and it's like a thousand times yeah i saw St- strangers on a train at a church Believe it or not. <laughs> and what was really funny about it was that sitting right behind me were these two older Which women. Which church? So it's a church in Astoria, and they were doing this really interesting um, series on like faith in cinema. I went to that. No, did I you went... see The Seventh Seal? No, I saw the one with Robert Mitchum. Not Robert Mitchum, the one with the priest. Uh, fuck, they play, I was... They play like three or four films. Yes, yeah, yeah. I that went was so to amazing. That. Yeah. I went a different night than you, but I went to that. It was meant to be. Because I went to see Touch the... Me right now. The... What? <laughs> Nothing. Go on. Zombie, like, zombie, zombie. Talk about um, only things that were so that are not on the cover. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a cranberries thing. Um, there's a film that I, I I'll check the name. Of oh after, wait, Robert Mitchum, the fucking um, not a um, uh, the Night of the Hunter. No, 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 no. Is wasn't that? that? I'll look it up after. But I was at. I went to that. I was watching Strangers on a Train. Two older women sitting behind me, and there was somebody very close to us just farting throughout the entire thing. <laughs> And the yeah, commentary. That was, that was me. And these women. That was obviously. This was yeah. hilarious. These women would gassy. not stop talking about oh like what was god. happening in the film. But over like, every like fifteen minutes, he'd be also be like, "Oh my god, who's doing that? It really smells badly." <laughs> Please tell me it was like. Yeah. Two and then old right, Greek and then, ladies. And then right, be, and then right. No, no, no. If they were Greek, it'd be like 
Τι μυρίζει, τι σου διαφορεύει αυτός. And then right behind those women, you'd hear like, yeah, it smells really bad, I don't know what's going on. And he'd be like, Lars, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to, I don't, strangers on a train. Hitchcock. Going back to the film, going back to the Talented Mr. Spirit, I was also really interested in thinking about what this film was attempting to say about um, queerness and gay identity like in the late 90s also. Huh. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't really have anything well, really concrete to say about that. Surely a film that takes place in the 50s could not be commenting on the time in which it was made. We all know that, George. No. Come on, George. Wait, Come but, on, wait, George. But, wait, what? But, but, Come on, George. But, so I was thinking about it, no joke, as like an allegory of like Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which I went back and I was like, oh, it was passed in like 94. Holy shit. And thinking Look at of, you, thinking making I, connections. I, I did my research. Of course, you well, fucking you know, believe a, a film research. that was made, but, sorry. Oh, no, but just also thinking about like, let's say, so that you mentioned Pink Flamingos and, and you, I, Kelly, I think you know a lot more about queer cinema than I do. Maybe not Liam, of course, because Liam knows everything about cinema. But to think about, let's say, how this I film do. is, he does. is, let's say, Uh, and I'm not saying this in a dismissive way, but like a mainstream representation mm-hmm. of what gay cinema m- might be like. So mm-hmm. again, like ver- like obviously like big budget, huge actors, um, or an established director, and what the film is trying, how the film is trying to like tap into, let's say, queerness, like mainstream queerness in the late '90s. And again, I had nothing really to say other than like thinking about like, oh, it might be interesting to think about it as like an allegory for like Don't Ask, Don't Tell and about like what gay politics might have been like in the Clinton administration in America at the time. And again, I didn't really think it through. But to think about, let's say, what was going on in queer cinema at the time, like on the margins, let's say, and like what was being made, what was like the avant garde like at that time and how, let's say, this was to some degree obviously responding to that, if not directly. Well, the big, I mean, I feel like the at that point, like 98 Velvet Goldmine also came out. Uh, uh, also um, Miramax, right? Yeah, and like 91 was Poison. Um, I think 94 was, you know, and to, 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 I mean, it's a very clear example. Todd Haynes is someone in the 90s who played like a huge role in queer cinema. And Safe was what, 94? Ooh, but I'm a Cheerleader is 99, too. Which I just rewatched that. I was wondering when Far From Heaven came out, too. 2002. Oh, okay, that's later. I'm, I'm a big Todd Haynes. <laughs> Clearly. Haines no, head? I actually just looked um, at it because I was Todd curious. Head? Todd Haynes Haines head? Haynes is a family name of mine. Um, mom's side. Anyway. Really? Yeah. You guys, are you related? I don't think so. Um, possibly, though. Yeah, well, Same know. spelling? H A Y? H A Y N E S, which is an unusual spelling. That's an unusual spelling. You It's an related. unusual How cool spelling, would it be? especially for white folks. <laughs> How cool would it be? I'd pronounce it Heinz, but that's just me. Well, say that's zebra. the ketchup. <laughs> that's, that's the ketchup. Ke- that's ketchup, George. Call, that, call that's, back, that's, back to our text that's and the conversation. Ketchup. That's the ketchup. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was just kind of curious to think about, again, like it, as an artifact of like the late 90s and kind of sexual politics in America at that time. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Because, again, it's like it is this like really fascinating film where so much, obviously, of like the queer desire is not spoken out loud. And like it is interesting that like the one t- time also like the term like homosexual is used it's used like as a deflection where they, like peter has to like translate it obviously yeah, the the translation is accurate but it is interesting that again it's not like like i feel like if this film was made today like you said it might not be so obvious but i think it would be like way more obvious well it'd be like, way more obvious in that we understand that like we as a cult- cultural would be able to relate to it but like the movie does such a nice job of laying bare the fact that 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 this is going on without mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. i don't know it's so cl- it's that's classy what, yeah. like yeah, movies well, aren't this classy it's like anymore subtle without being subtle yes. but i think i i and feel like feel it it's it's like a tr- it's 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 well, in what, you there's such when good you're watching tension. It. yeah yes. and i i feel like if it if it happened today like it would be more obvious but it would be in a less um I don't know. nuanced yeah yeah i, I guess that's the word nuanced. yeah well that's what's so great about it because and that's what i said earlier like it, it it seems like it's true to the sexual politics let's say of what it might have felt like in the 1950s let's say when the film takes place interesting mm-hmm. and like that's why i was like wow like it's also I, I accurate in that way yeah. yeah i totally agree with that um i was thinking about this uh, one thing that i'm curious about is like so one of the things that's really crazy about the ending of this movie is it ends in such like a Like what well, and it loops back from the beginning, which I didn't realize either. What? Yeah. The the opening scene is him like sitting there, like thinking about what he's done. 
Oh, that's right. He yeah, is reflecting. He is reflecting. Yeah, I the forgot very first about shot that. that. You see him, right? Oh. And then it cuts back to the very well. Very no, end in the end very end of, end of the door. movie, he's working as a janitor in Boston. Oh, that's right. Right, he's solving those problems. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So he's and then he, says, he gets I, caught. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Says, I gotta go see about a girl. <laughs> but who's a guy? But, yeah, but actually, yeah, that'd be I gotta amazing. go see about that'd a guy. Be amazing, yeah. I gotta go see about a guy. Somebody should do like a mashup of these two films. I'm t- it's already. I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> and put it together. I'll see you guys in six months. So then, um, like, he gets in the car and he drives away. Son of a bitch stole my mind, and then he murders. But murders there's no, yeah, there's no, s- there's no shot of him driving. There is that shot of him putting Freddie's corpse in the car, but <laughs> it would be an odd. We'll figure it out. It's Miles um, Davis instead of Elliot Smith. Is that? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to bring that trumpet, didn't you? Um, I'm sorry. Like I was wondering why you brought it to a recording. Yeah. Apparently, podcast. they had to teach you law the saxophone for this, according to IMDb. Oh, ah, so you actually learned something? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So we actually, like, that wow. fucking asshole Jude Law finally learned something. Good he for him. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for this movie. There you go. I looked it up. It was also up for Best Production Design, Best Score. Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Costume Design, which oh, mm. all earned. But why wasn't it up for Best Picture? What the fuck what the was fuck? up for Best Picture that well, year? Well, 1999 was a big year. 99 was a huge year There's for everything. There's that book everything. that came out. That's true. About 98 that. was the big, big. Oh, well, no, 99. No, 99. There Will Be Blood, Phantom Menace. What? <laughs> what? There was little, no, because my, my friend was reading, literally reading a book about, like, I think it's called, like, 99 the year. There Will Be Blood did not come out in 1999. Yeah, I did. Look it up. 2005, bro. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the book's about 2005. You're, that was, I had, like, cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Was it 2005? Both looked at each other there Will Be Blood came out when I was in college. That so, makes sense. It's yeah, like, 2005, 2005, 2005 sounds right. Maybe it's like Phantom, Phantom Menace. Phantom, Phantom Menace, though. 1999. Uh, the Matrix. And the, that's what it is. I always get The Matrix and The Will Be Blood Three Kings. Uh, American Beauty, Ugh, fuck American Beauty. Yeah, we we. Yeah, I know. I happiness. heard you guys talk about it. I haven't seen it in a very long time. Um, it's but not good. It's a, it's not good. I thought it was great when I was sixteen. But actually, the no. interesting parallel. When to I was this sixteen, film. I was no. into it. I was when I was sixteen. I no. I was. I'm a simple <laughs> no. man. Yeah, I am too. I love that film. <laughs> It, it inspired me so much. <laughs> it, it had some things it to say about. It probably did inspire Lars <laughs> so much. Um, Kel, I didn't like. I didn't like it mean? when it came out, and Kevin Spacey hasn't Dirt aged bag. well. And interesting parallels, though. By the way, with like the violence that heteronormativity can enact, though, with obviously the father. Chris um, Cooper is very good in American Beauty. If there's something good about that movie. He's it's, fu- it's funny. It's funny. It's funny because I did about think that. about That's it. Fair. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, if there were something good about that movie, it would be Chris Cooper. He's very. And no, the plastic bag seals the scene. <laughs> George, what's he was talking about? That's bullshit. Um, but I was thinking about the ending of this movie and I was like, uh, what's the moral? And I don't ask that like I expect a moral from a movie like this, but it also made me think about Psycho. Because could you imagine seeing Psycho in the 1960s and being like, what the fuck am I supposed to take from the ending of this thing? Like, I feel like a traditional classic all Hollywood film that I think this echoes in a lot of ways will have something at the end of it that makes you go like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to take away from this film. And it doesn't do that. It ends yeah. almost in media res with his own mm-hmm. tragic thing. And I think that that in and of itself is subversive and points back to the idea of like, he can't be, a, he can't be queer. He, so he has to murder. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I think that's that, interesting. I don't I know, something that's that, message, that yeah. kind of, <laughs> that's the message no seriously yeah. no i know yeah. it's just, it's just a funny way to put it yeah, yeah. So i mean i think the moral to. is always listen to marge marge knows best Mar- marge knows best. well that's an interesting thing about the movie is that it really does do a really great job of turning your sympathies towards marge in the mm-hmm. final 30 and then you're and then you're still watching matt damon you're like i hope this guy gets away yeah i know it's crazy right you're like still cheering him on even yes. as you're like yeah. you're like, yeah. don't, you're like, like don't kill don't marge but like yeah don't get caught too like yeah and again to come back to it i think that you know as we watch these philip seymour hoffman movies in a row i feel like i'm seeing sort of two things go go on i feel like i'm seeing this sort of like his ability to play these really pathetic guys but then this this like you know, I feel like we're not covering some of these movies, but I w- had a conversation with for an episode that we're doing about Twister. And there's a little bit of his performance in Twister in this and that it's this kind of like frumpy, ridiculous dude who's so overly confident. And that's yeah. an interesting juxtaposition against like mm. the way he is in, in some of these other films. Yeah. Like I, I feel like there's gradually this pattern emerging where he's like very good at playing both like a loser and like, Fuck you! What's up? Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Well, that's the kind of character is in MI3, which we'll be talking about later. Yeah. Well, and the really and the master and, and, and the other things too. like that. But there's this like I'm th- I've been thinking a lot about like 
the, Philip Seymour Hoffman as the idea of an everyman with all of the complexity that that term can imply in the mm-hmm. way that you think about things. Like when often when you it's like the term all American. When you say someone's all American, it usually codes them as like a white person, mm-hmm. and every yeah. man does the same thing. But there's this quality of that you could see that guy walk down the street and be like, oh, that's a guy, but he does so much as an actor in all these different films. I don't know. It's something I've been thinking. No, about. totally. Yeah. And he embodies these roles like amazingly well. Yeah, this movie is good. This movie is very good. (laughs) It's really good. Yeah, I would definitely recommend seeing it. It's definitely my favorite of the the movies we've watched so far. I know you guys are like in love with the Big Lebowski. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) I'm not wearing a Big Lebowski t-shirt right now. I'm the dude, man. (laughs) This might be the straightest thing I own, by the way. Yeah, Um, it's, it's it's a great film. It's this a great film, film. Yeah. yes, this good. film, yeah, yeah and, the big Lebowski. Lebowski. and the big Lebowski. You should watch all these films. films. You can decide about happiness. Um, well, I guess that's it. Should we wrap this? it up? Yeah, let's right. do it. Well, thank thank you, Cal, for for you being here in your apartment. Is there today anything you'd like to uh, yeah. plug? Yeah. Oh, please yeah. plug, plug away. Um, I like to plug my zines. Yes. Again. Um, I make zines about queer sailors and films and other delightful things. Um, you can find them on my Etsy shop at hello there sailor dot etsy dot com. I'm gonna put up a link also. In the metadata of this the episode, where you guys can go metadata, slow down with find big good words. Find yeah, what the fuck, nerd? This is very bad. Find uh, Kel's amazing work. Yes, that's true. I'm Lars von Trier. <laughs> I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Fragopoulos. I'm Kel Karpinski. And this was Uvra Basta. <laughs> <laughs> yay! Yay! Stop doing the yay! Leave, 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 leave Lars. Lars. You gotta go. <laughs> <laughs>